Welcome. This webinar is Selective Mutism Awareness in Schools. This is intended for education staff um, based at Wandsworth um, who, support, who are supporting children with selective mutism or whom they suspect may have selective mutism. I'm also aware that education staff from across the country and UK may also be viewing this as well. First of all, I just want us to start and just think about what it would be like if we were to see this spider in the room right now. How would we be feeling? And notice any changes, what would the different changes you'd be experiencing in your body? Would you maybe your heart racing or would you be sweating? Would you feel a bit nauseous? Would you be shaking or being a bit more fidgety? What would your behavior look like? Would you be constantly checking to see where the spider is? What if you couldn't see the spider anymore? Would you leave the room? So could you concentrate on this webinar or would you be preoccupied on where that spider is? Can you explain the reason or for the response? Is the reasoning rational? This actual spider is a cardinal spider. It is considered to be one of the largest spiders in the UK. Um, however, a bite is believed to be completely harmless and painless to humans. In fact, there are 650 species of spiders in the UK and only 12 species are able to bite humans and only two to three are considered to have a significant or unpleasant bite. So our reactions may seem irrational, but our responses are so strong. You know, for those who have a real spider phobia, arachnophobia, these responses will be significant and will impact a person's life. So not only will they experience that acute reaction to the threats, but they'll also start avoiding situations like maybe gardening, maybe avoiding the shed or, or going camping or going to parks or nature walks, and it will have an impact on their life. This is a quite a normal thing. When we experience a threat, we have a response. We have a fight or flight or freeze response. When it comes to fight, it may be if we saw this spider, the reaction would be to grab a slipper and trying to shoo it away or try and hit it. Flights would be to get out of the room and avoid the whole situation or freeze would be to literally just to freeze um, because of the fear um, that just overwhelms you. These responses are quite a natural response when it comes to threat. Um, we have these biological responses, the fast heart rate, the sweating, the tension and body and the dry mouth. We might have also the behavioral responses of these fight, flight and freeze. And also we have cognitive responses where we might predict or even catastrophize. If the spider comes closer, it might bite me. If it bites me, I'm gonna to have to go to hospital. If I go to hospital, I might die. And then we, because of these catastrophizing and these fears with these predictions, we start avoiding these situations. And as the more we avoid, the more the fear strengthens and the anxiety strengthens the next time we see a spider. And also because our limbic system is firing on all cylinders. There is a disconnect from our frontal cortex, which is our rational thinking. So often it's hard to explain why we respond in certain ways. So why am I saying all this? Well, selective mutism is, is considered to be an anxiety disorder in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual um, in the fifth edition. Alison Wingen said Maggie Johnson is also considered to be a phobia of talking or a phobia of being expected to speak or being heard to speak by others. So by understanding that, it helps us understand that actually what these children are experiencing, say in class or in school, um, can be just this significant, significant anxiety. And it's not just happening in one situation, but in many situations, because there's many situations where the child would be expected to speak. So also then has a knock on effect in terms of child's concentration, and also their communication. So to have a um, to be diagnosed with selective mutism based on DSM-5, they listed as first of all the consistent failure to speak in specific social situations in which there is an expectation to speak. Um, so often, say at school, despite speaking in other situations, so they're able to speak fine um, in when they're more relaxed in, in a more relaxed environment where there's no pressure there, and often it tends to be at home. But yet when they're in the situation, like a different situation in school, they're not speaking there. And this disturbance interferes the education, um, also for young people and adults, then um, affects their occupational achievements 
and also for all of them, it affects the social communication too. So the duration um, uh, of this um, silence is at least one month. Um, however, it does include the first month in school. So if a child has just recently transferred to your school, or maybe if um, they've just started reception, just wait, um, observe that for at least two months or so before referral. And also it's important to consider that the failure to speak is not attributed to the lack of knowledge or comfort, comfort with the spoken language. So in the context uh, here in the UK, for those children who have English as an additional language, However, having said, said that, that children with an additional English as an additional language are more at risk of developing selective mutism. So it's important to be mindful of that. Also that the disturbance or the inability to speak is not better explained by a communication disorder or a condition resulting in silence. However, also having said that, a lot of children with selective mutism will also have a coexisting communication difficulty, whether it be speech difficulty or a language difficulty. What's it like? Um, in a book written by um, Sutton and Forrester, um, it's uh, actually a, a really good book to read um, about adults' experience of selective mutism and their reflections of what it's like to have it when they were a child. Um, also has input from parents as well. Um, one student, Danielle, um, wrote, it feels as though you feel you physically can't talk, like the words won't come out. Justine also says, it's like a dominant force in my brain stops me from speaking. Panic freezes me to the spot. I can't control what I do. I can't think about the situation and resolve it. I feel like a paralyzed deer in the headlights. Often the symptoms that a child with selective mutism will experience is this tightness of throat in their throat. Um, or they also maybe experience an increased heart rate or sweating and the tension in the body, um, nausea or a sense of feeling of overwhelmed um, or being overwhelmed or maybe difficulty processing information or difficulty remembering words in that moment. Um, for most children with selective mutism, um, the, their communication or difficulties with communication in that moment can be considered more of a communication performance deficit rather than um, a communication competence deficit. So communication performance is that their performance of communication is impacted by their own anxiety rather than their inability to communicate effectively. Because what we find is when children are in an environment when they're feeling comfortable and they're relaxed, then actually their communication skills are fine. Um, however, when you add the anxiety on top of this, it may appear they may have communication difficulty, or maybe even appear to have a language disorder, or maybe appear to have social communication difficulties there, but actually when they are more relaxed, they, they have appropriate communication skills. So it's important to refer on to how this differentially diagnosed to identify um, what is what, and also because if they do have a um, coexisting communication difficulty, then that they need support in that as well. A few facts and figures. Um, Onset tends to happen in early childhood between the ages of two and five. It becomes more noticeable when a child enters usually nursery or school, um, usually around that age. And also it's slightly more girls than boys that are affected with selective mutism. Also bilingual, multilingual um, population are more, four times more likely than monolingual speakers to develop selective mutism as well. So they are high risk population. Also approximately one out of 140 children in the under eights population um, in a prevalent study was found to have selective mutism. And one in 550 children in um, older population, seven to 12 years. And then Sutton um, also um, wrote a dissertation on adults with selective mutism and hypothesized approximately one in 2,400 adults have selective mutism. Late access to services and diagnosis. Well, um, due to the lack of understanding and awareness, the average age of referral for children with selective mutism was roughly about nine years of age. This is the 1998 study. Um, also, two longitudinal studies um, tracked children with selective mutism were referred at roughly about eight years, five months. Um, and they had some intervention and they tracked them into adulthood and found that 42 to 61% continued to suffer with their semi-adulthood. 
Um, also with this, um, when you think about these studies, these children would have had selective mutism for at least three to five years or so. So by then, um, it uh, would have been very ingrained uh, in terms of um, the way they interact. So it would be harder sometimes um, to, to have an effect. Um, also, they find um, in some studies that adults with SM will have higher unemployment rates and are more likely to develop coexisting mental health conditions such as phobias and depression. Early access to services and diagnosis is key. Um, they found uh, Stone um, and colleagues wrote a um, systematic review and also meta-analysis and found that there was a stronger treatment effect um, when the children access behavioral therapy at a shorter time after onset. So the sooner these children are seen, the better, the stronger their treatment effect. And also Urbeck in Finland found that children um, with SM accessing intervention before this behavioral intervention before five years experienced more significant improvement than those six years and above. In the UK, we also give a descriptor when we give a diagnosis of selective mutism, either high profile and low profile. So high profile is quite clear. There is very clear that the child is not speaking to certain people in specific situations. Low profile, the child manages to speak a little when absolutely necessary, but does not initiate conversation or make requests. So these children are um, likely to be overlooked and are at risk of developing high, high profile selective mutism and also social anxiety disorder. But um, with both profiles, high and low profile, there's always a consistent pattern with body tension and wariness and tendency to freeze. Now, coexisting conditions, or the medical profession might use the word comorbidity, um, there are often communication difficulties in this population, the children with selective mutism. So in different research studies, 10 to 50%, um, there's a range there that may have communication difficulties. Certainly in Wandsworth, um, in a recent case note audit, roughly about 58% of the children with selective mutism had a speech or language difficulty. Um, also in the research literature, about 59 to 97% would have a coexisting um, other secondary um, anxiety disorder. So often social anxiety disorder um, is the highest comor comorbid, comorbid anxiety condition and then followed by separation anxiety and specific phobias as well. Also, the selective mutism population have um, a higher um, um, coexist um, comorbidity of um, autistic spectrum condition, um, about 7% as opposed to the general population, which is about 1%. And also 30% will have difficulties with um, enuresis, which is um, wetting, difficulties with wetting um, themselves. And also 17% um, will have difficulties with um, their coordination, um, often um, resulting in a diagnosis of developmental coordination disorder or also known as dyspraxia. 8% um, um, also would have, may have mild learning disability too. So we find the SM population is a vulnerable po uh, population. Now, it's so important, I can't stress this enough, just how important the role is for education staff to identify and also support these children. Um, in St. George's caseload and, and audit I did in 2018, um, and, um, and actually 2018 to 2019, we found that 60% of our referrals for SM came from education staff, which again, just highlights the importance of education staff because you guys are the ones who will spot um, the child with SM first, most often or not. Um, many parents will, might report they weren't aware that they had this. Um, they knew that the child was maybe quiet or perhaps shy, um, but it became very apparent that when they were at school, and it was the school staff to notice that they weren't speaking to them in that situation. Our second highest referrals were, came from parents um, who uh, were aware of selective mutism or concerned about the child's um, talking in school and then followed by health visitors and GPs as well. Now, if you, um, how to spot selective mutism for those who, um, you know, may have some suspicions. Well, first of all, consider all the quiet children in your class and then consider them their talking habits. So ask yourself, when do they speak? Um, is it only in the playground with their peers um, or do they speak at all in the classroom? 
Um, do they speak in small groups? Um, who do they speak to? Um, is it just only with peers or um, maybe certain adults? Um, or do they speak to most people? Um, where do they speak? Um, uh, sorry, um, where and when do they speak? So it, you know, which situations are they speaking in? And also how do they communicate? Um, do they just use gestures or do they, are they only using single words or phrases? Or are they only responding um, when you've asked them a question, but they're not initiating interaction or asking for help? Um, also just consider those children with English as additional language. The Stark in 2016 found that children who had, um, uh, were bilingual, multilingual, um, and exposed to a new language, plus having an anxious predisposition had a high risk of developing selective mutism. So those children who are EAL in your classes and also quite anxious and may have a tendency to freeze, then I would say treat them as a child with selective mutism in terms of using these strategies. They will help those children as well, if or whether they do or do not have selective mutism. It won't harm them, it will actually promote the communication skills as well. Also, what might be helpful is asking the parents if the child is speaking freely to them in front of other people outside of the home. If you then get a feedback that actually the child stops talking when someone comes over to the home or, um, or when they're out and about, the child speaks and then when a person goes near them, they stop talking, then you may be dealing with selective mutism there and uh, onward referral will be required. So to make a referral, find out the profession or the service that takes the lead in selective mutism in your area. So if you are in Wandsworth, um, where St. George's Hospital is, then um, the profession that's taking the lead is the speech and language therapy department. So refer the child to the speech and language therapy department. We accept referrals from everyone, everyone from parents, from, from teachers, from uh, uh, medical professionals. Um, so find out who's taking the lead um, in select mutism in your area. It could be the local authority, it could be educational um, psychology service, it could be maybe specialist teachers perhaps that might be taking the lead in select mutism or maybe pediatricians or developmental um, psychology as well. Uh, or it could be CAMS too. So identify who, which profession um, or service is taking the lead in select mutism and then refer onwards there. Um, also contact the Select Mutism Information Research Association for further information um, and also support on Select Mutism. And actually at their website, you can actually find this diagram. So um, it's quite helpful to then um, look at this diagram and, and follow it through to work out um, what the specific situation is in your locality, because each locality across the UK is very different. Principles for support and intervention. Um, the first thing is, is to take the pressure off speaking and create opportunities to communicate and participate. So that's if there's one principle, this would be it. Um, although there are other principles that are helpful too. But this one is it, is to take off the pressure of, of speaking, but create the opportunities to communicate and participate. Um, another important principle is addressing the speech anxiety with the child, whatever the age. Obviously, you'll have to adapt the language, um, but by sometimes I acknowledging um, that you are aware that it can be difficult for the child to speak in certain situations and that you want to take the pressure off them to do that and you want them to focus on, just focus on having fun and participating, then often that can be a, a huge relief for the child. And sometimes that can be enough just to get the ball rolling and moving forward in their communication at school. Also consider the communication risk during interaction and activities. There's certain things that we say and um, the way we interact that increases the risk of communication that makes it more difficult for the child to speak. And so always consider low communication risk. And there's a slide coming up where I'll be talking about that too. And another important principle uh, is when using a behavioral approach um, for um, selective mutism, always use small steps. Um, so use small steps to plan for all areas of need, actually, whether it be communication or even toileting um, or even eating in front of others. Sometimes some children with selective mutism find it difficult to eat in front of others or eat at the dinner hall or maybe go into the toilet or um, um, use the bathroom. So each of these, if it is a difficult thing and it's something that is important, then um, identify, create a small steps program, something that's going to make it easier for the child and just change one variable at a time. 
Um, also a really important principle is working collaboratively with parents and clinicians, uh, particularly for um, early years children. And obviously with school age children, it, you need to work collaboratively with the child themselves and also the parent and clinician too. Another important principle is just remembering that actually it's not all about speaking. As much as we want them to speak, um, before we even consider a speech in the classroom, we need to um, think about other things too. So first of all, ask yourself, is the child attending to the activity or is the child disengaged um, or in another part of the classroom? Um, so if the child is not attending, think about, okay, how can I facilitate that the child is attending to the actual activity? If the child's attending in, um, to the activity, then ask yourself, is the child participating non-verbally in the activity? And if the child isn't, then think of ways of how the child can participate non-verbally. If they are attending and participating, then think, is the child interacting non-verbally in the activity? And if not, then consider different ways that they can. Maybe they can um, interact through gesture or signs or using visuals or pictures or writing if they're old enough. Um, and then if they are um, then attending, participating and interacting, then you can start thinking about how you can bridge the gap uh, for them to interact verbally in class. So addressing speech anxiety. So it's there's different ways you can do that. Um, but um, just in simple, just breaking it down, it's just we, we want to convey to them, first of all, they're not alone, that this is a, a common condition, that, that there are a lot of children out there that find it difficult to speak when they're in front of new people or in front of others. And it won't always be like this if we do things that help. And there are ways that we can help. And so the first thing is to focus less on talking and more on having fun. Because if when the child is having fun, they're more likely to feel more relaxed and then feel it find it easier to then talk. Um, the second thing too to address and share to them is that we want to do things in tiny steps to achieve what they want to achieve. And the last thing is to have a have a go attitude. So just convey to them that we'll do this together. And anything that is difficult, we will have a go and try. So um, sometimes by just letting them know that you know and letting them know that you're not going to put any pressure for them to speak can just be a, a huge weight of their shoulders. So the hierarchy of communication risks. So consider using low risk communication when interacting with a child with selective mutism. It makes it easier there um, for them to speak in those kind of situations or using um, low risk communication as opposed to high risk. So low risk are things like when we make comments or maybe rhetorical questions where there's no pressure for them to respond verbally. Um, then moving up then might be a, a show me or which one type of question where it allows a child to respond verbally or non-verbally, either through pointing. Um, or yes, no question is also considered low risk as well, because again, they can either respond verbally saying yes or no, or they could nod or shake their heads. Now, X or Y question is that's the type of question where it could be like, is it an apple or is it an orange? So that's an X or Y question. That too is kind of low risk um, and also just um, requires just the one word answer um, or they can also point to if it's there. Um, then moving on to simple questions and then factual questions are moving up to high risk kind of questions to then open ended and personal questions are also considered to be high risk communication. Um, also, Greetings are considered to be high risk as well, even though it's only just one word. Um, a lot of people may think of it as being low risk and then expect the child and put pressure on the child to make those greetings to say hello, goodbye, please and thank you. So what's important to, is to consider that as high risk, that that is actually very difficult for a lot of children with selective mutism for various reasons. A, just the negative connotation and the pressure of communication and the social pressure of interacting with those kind of words too. Um, but also those kind of words tend to also invite further interaction. So consider your communicate the, the level of communication risk. Another strategy that's helpful is um, using what we, um, is coined defocused communication style when building rapport with a child. So defocused communication style is in effect, is you're interacting with a child in a way where you're not putting pressure for them to speak. 
So um, play fun activity, um, uh, something that the child enjoys. When the child's enjoying an activity, they're feeling more relaxed and they're more likely to feel more comfortable to speak and use their voice in that situation. So identify something that they enjoy. Um, when you're playing with them um, or interact with them or doing the activity that's fun for the child, then during that um, interaction, just make comments on the activity or the play. Um, use it like a commentary style talking with pauses and gaps in between. Um, don't ask direct questions to the child. You might ask maybe I wonder questions, which is um, asking yourself the question. So there's no pressure for the child to respond. Sometimes the child may feel comfortable enough to then respond in that situation once you've built that rapport. Um, also, it's important to just have those pauses you know, wait five seconds to give the child a chance to respond. A lot of children, they do want to talk, they do want to interact, but they find that the pace of conversation sometimes moving too quickly. And by the time they're ready to do that, by the time their vocal folds have loosened up and they're ready to speak, that is there's moved on from then and that's it, that further creates more anxiety when it comes to interacting. So leave pauses in between your comments. Um, also, another thing that's important is not making eye contact during the interaction, which seems um, difficult sometimes since we're so used to making eye contact during interaction and we often try to promote eye contact in the interaction. However, for children with selective mutism, eye contact can be very threatening. So try not to make eye contact when you're building that rapport. And often if you're doing an activity, play alongside them or do the activity alongside them rather than being face to face across the table from them. Otherwise that can be quite intimidating for them. Um, other general strategies uh, is after rapport building is having the child maybe sit in close proximity to the teacher. So whether it be carpet time or maybe um, whether the tables are positioned closer to the teacher's desk, just because A, if they do use their voice in the class, then you're more likely to hear what they're saying. Um, and then there's another factor too, in terms of proximity, that um, if they're perhaps at the back of the class, if they were to say something, then there's a risk that children will turn around and look at them and wait for their response. Whereas they're close up to you, the proximity, once you've built that rapport with a child and they're speaking freely with you in a one-to-one -one situation, in a classroom situation, they're more likely to use their voice or speak to you um, if, you're, if you're close together. So have them sit close to you in the class once you've built that rapport with a child. Also maybe use talking partners. So for those who are not aware of talking partners is when um, you have maybe in a classroom situation, you've posed a question to the class or maybe a topic and you ask um, peers to group in pairs and talk about that topic or talk about that question. And this can be quite helpful for children um, with selective mutism who are already maybe speaking to their peers, but maybe not speaking to in front of the whole class. So this allows them to participate because they're speaking, they find it comfortable to speak to their peers and also other children are speaking as well too. So they're not focusing on what's being said. Um, also for younger children, um, puppets can be used in play or in class and drama, and also maybe using um, during free play, allow children to use voice changes or recording devices, just to, as a form of desensitization to get them used to using their voice and recording the joy of their voice and having fun doing that. Also, you can use other forms of communication um, throughout the school. So using communication cards or dry whiteboards, um, if they're writing, also Makaton signs too, just to aid and, and encourage communication. Also, a way to build confidence is maybe consider the child using louder instruments in music, um, encouraging bigger and stronger actions or roles in mime and movement or dance. Um, also using choral speech, um, because choral speech is considered to um, be a low risk communication, um, low communication risk. Uh, so things like chanting, singing, and repeating lines in a story uh, can be easy for the child to actually participate and use their voice in the class by doing that as opposed to just speaking by themselves. Again, I just want to reinforce, don't insist on the child saying hello, goodbye, please, or thank you. Encourage maybe the sign, um, child to use maybe the sign or um, as an alternative. Also to build their confidence, maybe give the child a job or responsibility in class. Also, it's really important just to, um, when using a behavioral program, if you're working with a speech therapist or educational psychologist or clinical psychologist, that you, in the behavioral program, you change one variable at a time. And these are the different variables that can have an impact. So one variable will be in the environment. So where the 
um, activities being done. So is it being done in the playground? Is it in a room outside um, of the, the classroom or is it in the classroom? So the environment can have an impact as well. I often find children um, with selective mutism find that the, in the classroom is probably one of the hardest environments for them to use their voice. Also another variable will be the people involved in activity. Is it just a one-to-one -one activity with you and the child? Is it with another peer? Is it with two peers? Is it with other adults? Or maybe is, are there adults in the room that the child's not familiar with? Because just by having that one change in the variable there of a different person could be enough for the child to be silent. Also consider the time of the activity. Um, if it's a short time, um, and the child knows how long it's going to be, it'll be, they might find that easier to be able to manage their anxiety during that time, as opposed to an activity that just keeps going on and on and on and on, which in further increases the anxiety. Also consider proximity when you're introducing a new person to the child's communication circle, that um, where the proximity of that person, whether they are, um, in the room, whether they're at the table or not, that will have an impact. Also consider the language load or what I've spoken about in terms of communication risk. Is it a low communication risk or high communication risk? Also consider the type of activity. So an activity that the child enjoys or the child is good at, they're more likely to feel comfortable. They're more likely to speak in, um, in that situation as opposed to an activity that's more difficult for them or maybe sometimes maybe um, scholastically difficult. So to get more information, um, to, to access SMIRA, which is Selective Mutism Information Research Association, there's a professional's Facebook page there where you can ask questions um, and get advice as well. And there's lots and lots of resources um, on their website too for teachers. Um, also, iSpeak is a great website. It's designed by um, adults with selective mutism and it's for young people and adults with selective mutism um, to, to learn more about what selective mutism is and also to, to know that there are other people out there who have um, you know, selective mutism themselves and how they're coping in life. Um, also, Royal College of Speech Language Therapists has some resources as well you can log on to. Um, also important just to contact your local SLT department or CAM service or local authority or whichever service is taking the lead in selective mutism in your area. So again, to reiterate, in Wandsworth, it's the speech and language therapy department in St. George's um, Hospitals Trust. So I want to just emphasize before finishing off that um, as education staff, you play such a significant role, an important role um, when it comes to identifying children with selective mutism and also in supporting these children too, to bring out their best. So all the best in your journey and um, good luck.